So I, I would like to introduce Professor uh, Mauricio um, Donaldson. So, so Professor Donaldson uh, has a BSc in Mechanical Engineering in UDESA in 1998, MSc in Aerospace Engineering ITA in 2000, and a PhD in Aerospace Engineering in Imperial College London in 2005. And so he is Associate Professor, Head of the Aerospace Engineering Division, and the Director of the Laboratory of New Concepts in Aeronautics and uh, Institute uh, Technology Aeronautical ITA in Brazil. So he is responsible for teaching undergraduate and graduate courses, CMPQ. So he, he holds C, CMPQ fellowship, uh, and also he published uh, 83 papers in refereed international journals and 146 papers in conference proceedings. So he's expert uh, in aerospace engineering on topics such as the design of aerospace structures, composite materials, smart structures, finite element uh, modeling, damage modeling, and the impact dynamics. Professor Donald, now it's your talk. Okay, Professor Guan, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Mohammed and Dr. Rafael for, for the kind invitation to deliver this talk. It's a great pleasure for me to share the work we have been doing at ITA, particularly the work at, at LNCA. And my talk uh, today is focused on a fracture behavior of a woven carbon fabric laminate at high strain rates. The talk has been divided into seven parts, seven sections. I will start with a brief introduction about the LNCA at ITA. And, and then after that, I will move on the motivation of the present work, followed by uh, the specimen configurations that we have been, that we, we used for, for, for this work. And and then after that, I will talk about the experimental setup that we have used for measuring the fracture toughness under quasi-static tests, followed by um, a second setup that we used for the dynamic tests. And finally, um, I will present uh, the results, followed by summary and concluding remarks. Well, uh, starting with a, with a very short introduction about the LNCA. Uh, LNCA stands for the Laboratory of New Concepts in Aeronautics. It is a lab that was created five years ago, focused on innovation and entrepreneurship within the academic environment, particularly in the aerospace and aeronautic sector. Um, is a lab composed by researchers from different departments, which have different expertises uh, from going from flight physics modeling, uh, passing through integrated flight dynamics, aero server elasticity, aeroacoustics and lightweight structures and integrated aircraft propulsion system. Um, our focus at LNCA is to address a particular problem of the industry in a multidisciplinary framework in a such way that we can actually combine this expertise in a, within a unified way to come up with a conceptual design. Besides, uh, LNCA also provides training for the, for the industry. Uh, um, examples of that is, is actually the professional master together with Embraer uh, and also a professional master together with the Brazilian Air Force focus on, on, on aviation safety. Right now, uh, we have uh, three projects running together with Embraer in, in LMCA. Uh, those projects, they are, uh, they compose what we called here 
the aircraft green platform is a, is a platform focus on on aviation of the future is a project founded by the Brazilian innovation agents and as I mentioned before together with Embraer these three projects they are actually uh, the first one is investigating the application of uh, high performance composite in, 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 in aerostructure this is a project coordinated by myself and uh, we have another project which integrate also this aircraft green platform focus on flight physics and a third one focus on aeroacoustics our uh, research group is actually uh, the particular one focus on composite material is composed by 17 professors at ITA from different departments. As I mentioned before, uh, we have this sort of inter and multidisciplinary nature where we can combine expertise from different departments. We have academic partnerships uh, worldwide um, in several universities, not only here in Brazil, but also uh, outside Brazil. Um, we also have partnerships with companies, Embraer, as I already mentioned. We also have partnership with some local companies working with composites here in San Jose dos Campos, where, where IDA is located. Um, I like to mention some of them. Uh, Akair is one of them, Senic in Engineering, Hecotech, and also Petrobras. Uh, not, uh, 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 we also have a partnership with uh, the Technological Research Institute in Sao Paulo, where um, we have some ongoing work in the Lightweight Structure Lab, which is located here in, in, in San Jose dos Campos. Uh, in terms of uh, researchers and, and postdocs, PhD and MSc students, we have right now two postdocs in our group. Uh, both of them uh, focus on, 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 on composites. Uh, we have about 15 PhD students uh, at LMCA and about uh, 19 students were part of them are, of course, students from the master pro, uh, uh, professional master program together with Embraer. And also we have a technician that provides all the technical support in our, in our lab. In terms of uh, in industrial partners, uh, we have partnerships with several companies, local companies, as I mentioned before. In Braer, we have uh, an ongoing project focus on thermoplastic together with Toray, uh, with a group in Netherlands. Um, we have partnership also with uh, Autec and Autav, which are two companies that actually manufacture composite parts for, for Embraer. Uh, together with Sanik, Hecotech, as I mentioned before, and also Akair. In terms of uh, health, we also have a partnership with a ITA former student at CELAS Health uh, Systems. Um, a partnership also with Petrobras, which is a company focused on oil and gas. And and particular with Avibras, which is a company focused on space and defense, which has several projects together with the Brazilian Air Force on, on space and defense. In terms of academic partners, as I mentioned before, we have partners, a partnership with several uh, universities worldwide. I'd like here to, to highlight some, some of them. University of Twente is one of them that we have a very strong Cooperation as well as TU Delft, Imperial College London, Technical University of Berlin, and also uh, University of Poitiers in France. <clears throat> now, moving on, on the motivation of the present work in the past uh, uh, 10 years, 
our group has been focusing on the development of high fidelity damage mechanic based failure models for modeling damaging composite materials, right? And those models, uh, they um, somehow bring together within a phenomenological way, a set of criteria, uh, stress-based criteria that are used for uh, detecting damage initiation. And a set of criteria that we actually use uh, to detect damage pro progression. Uh, and in order to describe the damage evolution associated with each damage mechanism within the composite, we must somehow to characterize and to understand how damage initiates and also damage, how damage propagates. We have done that in two different ways. Uh, the first one is within a quasi-static uh, frame uh, fashion where we actually carry on uh, standardized mechanical tests and understand how strength and, and failure strain changes uh, with the strain rate, for instance, right? Um, and still within uh, the quasi static uh, fashion, we also, uh, <clears throat> by using um, fracture mechanics, we understand how damage progresses and how this. Uh, critical strain energy release rates actually vary with the strain rate within the material. Trying somehow to excite each failure mode individually and then later on by using a sort of combined loading condition, trying to bring them together uh, by using suitable specimens to build up a sort of propagation failure criteria. This also applies for the initiation criteria, which is essentially stress-based. Therefore, I mean, most of the work, or most of the damage mechanics, um, failure models that we have been uh, working on, they used a stress-based criteria for damage initiation and uh, energy-based criteria for damage progression. So we can actually use um, some advanced algorithms to control the dissipated energy uh, associated with each failure mode, regardless of the mesh refinement, by using a sort of a smeared crack, cracking approach. Um, and all, the, all of that, I mean, trying to bring and trying to understand and trying to predict as much as we can uh, in, a, in, a very, in, in a very high fidelity uh, way the behavior of the composite under different loading conditions. On the right hand side, you have there, I mean, some uh, images showing a crashing simulation and a comparison with experiments that we have performed here at ITA. As we can see, I mean, we, we have very, a fairly good correlation in terms, not only in terms of structural response, but also in terms of damaging morphology. This is because as I mentioned before, we, we actually try in a very, in a very uh, 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 deep way to understand how damage initiates and how damage progress uh, uh, within, within each ply of, of our composite under the study. Uh, one of the critical points here, I mean, to, to, to use this approach, as I mentioned before, we have somehow to characterize the critical strain energy release rate to build up or to define our propagation criteria. Uh, as you may know, most of the tests that we have right now for metallics to measure this property, they are not standardized for composite particularly if we perform high strain rate tests. Within this context, we have spent some time uh, trying to design some suitable specimens that allow the characterization of such properties for composite. And some of these setups or specimen configurations, they are shown here in this slide, where one of them is actually the four-point bending, uh, four bending test 
where we have a translaminar crack going through the thickness. We are talking here about intralaminar fracture toughness. And we use this specimen configuration for measuring the tensile fracture toughness associated with fiber breakage in matrix cracking by using this specimen configuration. And on the right hand side, we have the double edge notched that we actually use for measure the, the fracture toughness associated, particularly with fiber kinking, which is one of the failure modes that we have incorporated in, in our damage mechanics based model. All these specimens, they were designed in a way that we have a very high stress concentration at the crack tip or in the notch, which is a sort of desirable feature. Uh, furthermore, they have suitable layup in order to ensure that we excite the desirable uh, failure mode. And moreover, they also must fit in a, in a split Hopkinson pressure bar because the idea here is not to characterize only the quasi-static properties, but also uh, the, the, the properties at very high strain rates. Um, the definition of the specimen configuration and dimensions, they were based on actually on, uh, they were based on simulation. I mean, uh, some points here were addressed to define the configuration. The first one, as I mentioned before, the stress concentration factor we must have a very high stress concentration factor at the crack tip in order to ensure that we, we, we have propagation ahead of the crack tip. And, and the stress concentration in campus, it is not only dependent on the geometry, it depends on also on the layup, right? Um, we also must have a, a sort of a very, a, a fairly high transmitted pulse and the bar in order to quantify uh, the strain rate or in order to measure the strain rate by using the unidimensional stress wave propagation theory. Um, and also uh, we must have uh, um, a reasonable amount of reflected pulse in order to compose the strain uh, within, within this test, right? With the strain within the specimen, we can actually, uh, and, and also with the forces in, in the bar ends, we can actually compute the stress and have the stress strain uh, plots for different strain rates and also quantify with these properties or with these quantities, the, the, the intralaminar the fracture toughness at different strain rates. Here I have listed uh, some of the advantages in, in of, of these specimen configurations. If we look, for instance, for the single uh, edge notch bending specimen, it's a very easy uh, to manufacture specimen. It does not require any extra device to hold the specimen in the bar. No? And, and if well designed, we ensure that the failure uh, occurs only within the notched area, which is a sort of desirable feature for this test. And uh, another good point about uh, using this specimen configuration is that we don't need, uh, there is no need for uh, the transmitted pulse. We did just need the incident pulse to compose or to, 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 to obtain the, the intralaminar fracture toughness. For the then specimen, which is the double edge notch it, um, again, is a very easy specimen to manufacture, even easier than the SEM. Uh, it can be easily adapted in a direct way to the split Hopkinson pressure bar. It also ensures a very high transmitted pulse. And if well designed again, we ensure that failure occurs only within the notch area. Uh, as, as I already mentioned about the standards, and um, we have no standards to, 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 for, that, for data reduction uh, for the determination of this for, of the strain energy release rate for composite for the intralaminar fracture toughness of composites, right? 
Therefore, uh, we have to find a way to measure that directly. And the way we actually used here for measuring directly the, 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 the strain energy release rate or the strains, the stress intensity factor was by using digital image correlation. Um, on the left hand side here, you have two uh, figures or two pictures showing the SEM, uh, the dam configuration, uh, where we have specimens loaded under quasi static regime. Um, if, you, if you look carefully here at the crack tip, what we have done, we actually white painted the specimen as all the specimens used in the DIC measurements required. We actually, uh, we sprayed on some black speckles on it and we defined some targets uh, required by the strain gauge, uh, video, video gauge measurements. We use actually the video gauge here to measure the strain field at the crack tip. And by measuring the strain here, by and also using the Westingard uh, uh, fracture driven forces at the crack tip expression, which depends on the stress field at the crack tip, we can actually measure directly the stress intensity factor. Um, it's keeping all the standards that we have actually available right now for metallics, but not for composite, right? We have done that for, uh, for the same specimens and also for the double edge specimens, as you can see here. Here we have some details of the failure within, within the knots in compression, which is a failure uh, dominated by, by fiber kinking, which is a sort of desirable failure mode that we excited in this test. And then the dynamic test we perform in a, a split Hopkinson pressure bar available in the aerospace lab, structure lab at ITA. Here I show you some details of our bar. We have a gas gun here. Uh, incident bar placed there. We also have a thermal chamber that allows uh, performing tests at different temperatures, going from minus 54 up to 100 degrees. We also have a high speed camera that allows, I mean, measurements and also um, acquisition of, of images during the fracture uh, uh, process. And the transmitted bar a little ahead here from, from, from the thermal chamber. Um, the two pictures in the bottom here show the details of the specimens placed in the split Hopkinson pressure bar. Again, they were white painted to, to aid the visualization and also to improve the contracts during the DIC measurements. And by using uh, the dynamic equilibrium, we can actually show that for the dam specimen, the forces at bar ends, they can be computed from the transmitted pulses. Uh, to measure the transmitted pulse, we have a pair of strain gauges uh, uh, actually located at the middle of the incident and the transmitted bar in such a way that we can measure these pulses during the test. By measuring the pulses, we can actually have the transmitted uh, uh, pulses. And with the transmitted pulse, we can compose uh, the load. Uh, with the reflected strain, which we are obtained from the, the reflected pulse, we can uh, uh, obtain for the dam specimen the strain rates. And by using the DIC measures, we can actually have the strain ahead of the crack tip and with the knowing the, 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 the stiffness of our composite, we can compose or we can determine the stresses. And by using the Westingard inspection, we can actually compute the stress intensity factor. Of course, I mean, the targets, they are not uh, uh, quite located at the crack tip. And then we don't have the stress intensity factor at the crack tip, but we can extrapolate by using the Westingard expression um, uh, the key, the KI at the crack tip in order to have our KAC at the moment of failure. Um, 
we can actually, uh, under plain stress conditions, we can convert the stress intensity factor into the strain energy release rate by using this expression that are applicable for um, um, orthotropic laminates under uh, plain stress conditions. And with that, we have our uh, intralaminar fracture uh, uh, toughness measured at different strain rates. Um, in a similar way, by using the same specimen, uh, we can compute the load at variance by using the dynamic equilibrium equation. In this case, I mean, um, uh, the, 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 the force depends on the incident and, and reflected pulses that were measured by the two pairs of gauges that I mentioned before. Uh, with the failure stresses by using this configuration and the thickness and the time of failure, uh, better saying, we can actually compute the strain rate and the stress intensity factor in a similar way of the demi specimen applied for the demi specimen, we can actually measure the strain field ahead of the crack tip. And by using Westingard, we can actually compute the stress intensity factor. And by extrapolating that at the crack tip, we have the KIC at the moment of failure determined at different strain rates. As for the demi configurations, we have plain strain conditions, we can convert the stress intensity factor into um, uh, fracture toughness by using this expression here, where uh, E bar is the effective laminate Young model. Um, it is worth mentioning here that when we actually compute the stress intensity factor by using the standard or standardized expressions for metallics, uh, these standardized expressions that are commonly used, they do not account for autotropic effects. Therefore, I mean, uh, what we have done here from the directed measurements of the KA uh, using DIC, we actually proposed uh, a new correction function mm -hmm. which accounts for orthotropy. Yes? Brother, you, you need to uh, ramp up. Thank right. You. Okay, thank you. We can actually correct the effects of orthotropy in trying to get our, our stress intensity factor. I mean, this uh, correction factor is obtained from FE simulations. Here, I mean, I show some results here showing how the stress intensity factors varies with the strain rates. We can see here that it's very sensi sensitive to the strain rate. Uh, where we have an increase or enhancement on the stress intensity factor as well as an intralaminar fracture toughness with the strain rates. The same also applies for uh, the intralaminar fracture toughness in compression, where we have also enhancement on the stress intensity factor with the strain rates. Here I show uh, some pictures or some movies just obtained from the high velocity speed high-speed cameras showing how the crack propagates in both specimens. We also performed some photography analysis to understand um, uh, how the composite fails here and which sort of stresses are dominant in each failure process, either in tension and compression. Uh, we could see, I mean, as expected, the microbucking was, was a predominant failure mode in, in, in compression and tensile failure in the fibers was a dominant failure mode in tension. And finally, to conclude, as my, my time is, is over, this work actually presented a detailed numerical and experimental study on the intralaminar fracture behavior of plane wave, uh, plane wave laminates under mode one loading in the dynamic regime. We perform simulation using different specimen configuration in order to define an optimum testing configuration to adapt to the conventional split hub case and pressure bar. Uh, experimental tests were performed at three different strain rates, loading tension with the specimens, loading tension and compression, the warp direction, in order to investigate the strain rate effects on the intralaminar fracture toughness. And some concluding remarks um, have indicated here, uh, we have found that the experimental results indicate that the intralaminar fracture toughness 
we studied here, here in are very sensitive to the strain rate effects, indicating a linear dependence on, on, the, strain, on the fracture toughness with the strain rate. Fractography analysis indicated the fracture process in woven composites very complex due to the fabric architecture composed by different failure mechanisms such as transverse fracture, longitudinal fracture, fiber pullout, and fiber kinking. And also the experimental results obtained using the proposing testing methodology provide input database and experimental evidence for validation of a virtual testing platform under development at ITA to predict behavior of composites subjected to extreme loading such blast impact impression. I thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank my students who actually helped me with the, all this with this work and also my uh, our sponsors. That's fine. So thanks so much, uh, Professor uh, Donaldson. Um, now is uh, is question time. Any any question from the audience? First of all, thank you very much, Donaldson, for the presentation. Uh, very interesting. Uh, actually, I've got a couple of questions, but uh, I would say the main question is about uh, one of the specimens you, you showed, you took as an assumption the equilibrium of the specimen. Yes. Um, I understand that actually it's challenging to, or even is the only way to, to, to solve this, but did you evaluate this equilibrium somehow, or you just took this as an assumption? Uh, we actually, uh, Rafael, uh, thank you for your question. We actually, uh, in order to, to, to verify the equilibrium condition, we actually plotted the, the, the forces at the bar ends, and both are bar ends between uh, where the specimens were located, and they were fairly the same, ensuring a sort of uh, quasi, quasi equilibrium condition, let's put it in this way. But I mean, from the forces of uh, on the bar ends, we actually could confirm that we had a sort of fairly quasi equilibrium equation condition. So, so although you, you use only the incident bar, you also recorded the transmitted pulse in order to evaluate this, right? Yes, that's right. Ah, great. I understood that uh, the, a, a bit different. Very nice and interesting. You know, you test uh, this composite uh, kind of tension and compression, yeah? Yes. So to, to model compression, do you think it is, it's more challenging than tension, yeah? That's right. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, so, so, so this uh, damage, you know, this uh, kind of uh, buckling, uh, you know, those, uh, de you know, debonding, you know, those, um, so when you uh, develop computer models, did, did, did you do kind of a massive scale uh, modeling? So you model kind of a single fiber with, with the metrics? No, Professor. Uh, we actually model everything at the massive scale, right? Yeah. And in order to account for fiber kinking, we actually used a phenomenological failure criteria based on the Puck and Schurman criteria mm -hmm. for tension and compression, assuming that we have an initial misalignment in the fiber in a mesoscale, in a mesoscale fashion. We don't actually me, uh, model a, a single fiber uh, uh, by using this approach. Right, right. So that, that uh, uh, maybe you know, in future, in when you have kind of much scale modeling. <laughs> yeah, so that would be nice. From mic micros to meso and to macro. <laughs> That's right. I mean, but remember the fabric architecture that we are dealing with is very complex. Uh, yeah. and, I mean, for UD is difficult. I mean, to have a very good micro model. Yeah. This scalar model. I mean, it's even more difficult if you deal with a fabric. This is Absolutely. certainly um, yeah. uh, uh, an object of further research. This is challenging, yeah. I mean, depending yeah. how, how many fibers are you going to take into account? <laughs> yes, fiber volume fraction, that's it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's good. So any question from the audience? Any more question, final question? So if there is no more questions, thank you, Professor uh, Donald. Uh, okay, so, so I will move to the next, uh, next speaker. Thank you.